event. Uh, before I present, I introduce the featured speaker to you, I thought it would be beneficial to give you a brief introduction to what the Society of Catholic Scientists is all about. As I mentioned before Mass, uh, my name is Christopher Lee and I'm the president of the New Mexico chapter of SCS. And uh, I also am a physicist up at Los Alamos National Laboratory. There will be a quiz later if you can identify the famous Catholic scientists who are on this title slide. If you get them all, PDL will give you an extra cookie. <laughs> Before we proceed, however, on this feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, let's uh, say this beautiful prayer that he, he composed to be said before, uh, before study. So if you will join me in praying together. Oh, next slide, please. I forgot, I have to mention that. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, lofty origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your brilliance penetrate into the darkness of my understanding and take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, an obscurity of both sin and ignorance. Give me a sharp sense of understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in completion. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Next slide, please. Uh, next, I want to um, begin with some very important thank yous. First, to the larger Society of Catholic Scientists, of, we, of which we are one regional chapter, for providing much of the financial support that makes this and other events possible. Um, and much of the activity of the SCS, in turn, is made possible by generous grants from the John Templeton Foundation. And we're extremely grateful to them for their support. I want to thank my fellow New Mexico chapter board members, a couple of whom are with me here today, Wes Even, our secretary from Los Alamos, um, and Andrew Gentry from uh, UNM. Our, uh, our, sorry, Wes is our treasurer and Andrew is our secretary. Um, I also want to thank very much uh, Project Defending Life for providing the support for the food and providing the food um, and uh, support for bringing the speaker here today. So please uh, consider them in your support. I want to thank, again, this parish community, especially in this beautiful space uh, for both worship and for this presentation. Um, it's in indeed very fitting that Father, Father Tai, with his scientific and engineering background, is our celebrant today. I mean, where else are you going to hear a homily comparing faith and reason to the magnetic field of the Earth? That's a beautiful <laughs> image. I will keep that image in, in my mind. Um, my connection with Father Tai is when he was a seminarian, he spent a summer at uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish in Los Alamos, where we met and struck up a friendship. I think we played tennis a couple times. I don't think you beat me, but, um, but you became a priest, so, so we are extremely grateful uh, to you for your vocation and for your beautiful uh, homily, very fitting homily today uh, at the, on this occasion. Next slide, please. The Society of Catholic Scientists was founded in 2016 by six eminent Catholic scientists from many different fields, led by the founding and current president, Stephen Barr, professor of physics at the University of Delaware. There is a picture here of that first gold mass that was celebrated at MIT in 2016. The SCS is recognized by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops as a lay association of Catholic faithful and is listed in its official Catholic directory. We have grown in the last six or seven years to over 2,000 members all around the world in over 60 countries. In New Mexico, we have 47 officially registered members of the SCS, which happens to be the 15th largest number out of the states in the US. If I can get five of you to join us yes today, we will catch Virginia. <laughs> Our main activities are the annual conferences, which so far have been held in Chicago, in Washington, D.C., at Notre Dame, 
This summer, in June, the first weekend of June, the SCS Annual Conference will be held at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. So if that fits into your summer travel plans, please check out the SCS website uh, for information on membership and how to join the annual conference. Our chapter here in New Mexico was founded in September 2019. We are actually the first regional chapter that was established officially in the world. Uh, I th think the ones after us, us were Spain and Poland. Um, you might wonder how a small corner of the world here had the first chapter of SCS, but if you look around Los Alamos or even this community here, you, you run into a lot of Catholic scientists. And uh, the vice president at the time of SCS was invited to give a talk in Los Alamos, and he looked around and saw a lot of Catholic scientists, and we were invited by the board to establish this regional chapter. Uh, these are the board of directors of the SCS, Professor Barr, the president, um, and many other uh, scientists. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, many other scientists from well-known universities in a wide variety of fields, from physics to biology to astronomy, um, and even uh, a, a, a theologian, um, to keep us honest as Catholic scientists. But remarkably, it's not the uh, Dominican priest you see on here who's the theologian. He's a physicist, and it's Professor Christopher Baglow, uh, who is our theologian representative. And Maureen, our speaker today, is also a member of the board. The society was founded as an answer to the call of Pope St. John Paul II, who wrote in 1987 to the director of the Vatican Observatory, those members of the church who are active scientists can provide a much needed ministry to others struggling to integrate the worlds of science and religion in their own intellectual and spiritual lives, as well as to those who face difficult moral decisions in matters of technological research and application. So the SCS answering this call is, uh, defined its mission in four parts. First, to foster fellowship amongst Catholic scientists, which I hope you just did in front of the coffee and cookies outside. Second, to witness to the harmony between the vocation of scientist and the life of faith, as Father Tai so beautifully preached to us today. Third, to be a forum for reflection upon and discussion of questions concerning the relation of science in the Catholic faith, which this event also does. And fourth, to act as a resource for all Catholic educators, pastors, and lay people, for journalists and the general public who have questions about the significance of scientific theories and discoveries and about the relation of science and faith. If you have some time, Google, oh, sorry, I didn't ask you to go to the next slide. We are on, yes. I just read those. Um, but there, this book in the bottom right-hand corner, Faith, Science, and Reason, is written by one of the board members of uh, the SCS, Christopher Baglow. I encourage you to Google that and get a copy. It's really a great resource uh, as laid out in this fourth pillar of our mission. At this time, remembering the uh, passing, recent passing, of our beloved Pope Benedict XVI, uh, I wanted to make sure to relay so words that he left us in his final spiritual testament. He devoted quite a significant paragraph to this notion of the relation between faith and science. Pope Benedict told us, I say now to all those who in the church have been entrusted to my service, remain firm in the faith. Do not let yourselves be confused. Often it seems that science is able to offer irrefutable results in contrast with the Catholic faith, but I've been able to see, over time, how apparent certainties against the faith have vanished, proving not to be science, but philosophical interpretations only. Just as, moreover, it is in dialogue with the natural sciences that faith, too, has learned to better understand the limit of the scope of its affirmations and therefore its specificity. I have seen and continue to see how the reasonableness of faith has emerged and is emerging again from the tangle of hypotheses. Jesus Christ is truly the way, the truth, and the life, and the church with all her insufficiencies is truly her body. And I didn't include this in my slides, but being here at this parish, I think it's, I wanna convey you know, thoughts about another pope, uh, Pope St. John the 23rd. I think it's very fitting that we are celebrating this mass here at this, and having this event here at this parish. Uh, in on, uh, at, uh, named in honor of Pope John XXIII, who of course opened the Second Vatican Council. And I think 
Honestly, one can consider the Society of Catholic Scientists itself to be one of the genuine fruits of the Council, which called all lay Catholics in particular to take a more active role in evangelization and in the life of the church, uh, in particular in the places where we live, our vocations as lay people, and in this case as Catholic scientists. And so I think the opening of the Council um, through a very real chain of causation uh, has given rise to the establishment of the SCS. To reflect on, add my own personal reflections on that a little bit, I wanted to share my opinions about what the SCS is and what we are here to do, and more importantly, not do. <laughs> First of all, the SCS, to make clear, does not speak for the Catholic Church, nor even for all Catholic scientists. To paraphrase something that's said about Domin the Dominican order sometimes, you meet one Catholic scientist, you've met one Catholic scientist. The views presented in any of our talks are those of the individual presenter, including my own, um, however, that in fellowship, we laity are invited to share what we find fruitful in our personal life of faith and in the practice of our vocation, for example, as scientists, with one another, with the church, and with the whole world. In doing so, we adhere to the faith of the Catholic Church with due regard for her magisterium. It is one of the requirements for members that they be practicing Catholics. And so we are here to serve the church and one another by sharing discoveries about the natural world through science or other areas of expertise that may enlighten our understanding of some aspect of our faith or that may even aid in the precise formulation or the practical, practical application of truths and teachings of our faith. You can think of many examples, I'm sure, just a few I listed here. We learn through Revelation in Genesis that God created the universe in an orderly, intentional fashion, creating in all of it to be good. Science can enlighten that story by answering, well, how long ago was that exactly? With what sorts of order and symmetry in nature? And do we even see in the physical universe signs that it is ordered toward intelligent life? The second example, we know of course from Revelation and our teaching and even just natural uh, morality that human life is sacred. But when precisely does a human organism begin to live or cease to live, as the case may be? And that, answer, that question I'll leave to our speaker today to give more of an answer. The third example that has been very relevant in recent years, um, from our faith, from moral theology, we can learn about the morality of various levels of cooperation with evil, which is unavoidable in our, in our world today. But there's formal cooperation, material cooperation, proximate cooperation, remote cooperation. Um, but to evaluate these criteria in a particular case, you may need to know some scientific or technical details that only experts can help you answer. For example, is a vaccine that may have been developed from a cell line originating in an aborted fetus in the past moral? Well, to know, make an make a intelligent judgment about that, you need to know, well, how remote is that connection actually? How severe is the disease that this vaccine is designed to combat and how effective is the vaccine? These are questions that science and experts can help answer and help us make an informed moral judgment. I've been vaccinated four times, just by the way. Uh, before I turn it over to the speaker, um, I wanted to advertise some upcoming events that we have this year. On April 29th, the last Saturday in April, we will have the New Mexico Regional Spring Conference of the SCS on various topics uh, touching on the relation between science and ethics. And we have confirmed speakers on topics such as genetic engineering, vaccine development, embryonic stem cells, just war and nuclear deterrence, and uh, transgender issues. Maureen is in fact one of our invited speakers, so we'll be very happy to welcome her back in just a few months. And as I mentioned in June, we have the annual conference of the whole SCS at Seton Hall in New Jersey. Um, and besides these, we have ongoing study talk, activities, talks, um, fellowship activities, according to member interest and participation. So if you'd like to participate in the life of SCS, please, please join our chapter, or at least our mailing list, um, and participate in our activities. We, most of our members happen to be in Los Alamos at the moment, um, but we would love to grow the chapter here in Albuquerque. I know there are lots of Catholic scientists around here and those interested in the topics our society studies. 
check out uh, uh, the next following slide, please. Check out the website catholicscientist.org for information on the entire SCS and how to apply for formal membership if you are interested. If you pay dues to the SCS, some of those dues come back to our chapter here in New Mexico. Our New Mexico chapter has its own website on Google Sites. The address is given here. We'll share these slides afterwards so you can look these up. Or email us at this Gmail address, scs.nmchapter at gmail.com, to join our mailing list and to learn about our future activities. Uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization, so we do gratefully accept your donations to support the activities of the chapter. You can take a picture of that QR code and you can go right to PayPal. Or our board members outside will be happy to accept any contributions you feel moved to give as well. And um, I also encourage you to support Project Defending Life, who have joined us to sponsor this event where we, a scientist, will help um, illuminate our understanding of just how precious and dignified human life is. So that's all I have to say to you. So um, you can switch the slides to those of the main speaker and I'll, as I give her an introduction. So, uh, you weren't, I know you didn't come here to listen to me. You came here to listen to Dr. Maureen Kondik of the University of Utah. She's an associate professor of neurobiology at, uh, at the University of Utah. Her research focuses on the role of stem cells in development and regeneration, and she has been recognized by both the Basil O'Connor and the McKnight Awards. She is currently a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, and in 2018 was appointed by the President of the United States to the National Science Board. And as I mentioned, she's also a board member of the Society of Catholic Scientists and won its 2019 St. Albert Award, which is given to one Catholic scientist annually. I was at the 2019 award presentation to Maureen and her talk at that time, which was on the same topic, and I was so impressed by that talk that since then I've been scheming how I could invite her to come to New Mexico, and I think very gratefully she is here today. She's, she's the author of the books Human Embryos and Human Beings um, and Untangling Twinning, um, and she's taught human embryology at, Utah, at the Utah Medical School for 20 years. She has a strong commitment to public education and has presented over 250 seminars and interviews, both nationally and internationally, on science policy, bioethics, and her own research. And we are honored she is here today to tell us about the topic, Human Life and Death Are Defined by Organization. So, welcome, Maureen. It's going to give us enough sound. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Uh, I also hope to be incredibly clear, but I found out when I gave this talk yesterday that at the end there were questions, shockingly. And um, I'm going to ask all of you to, in anticipation of potential questions, to write down my email address while it's up on the screen so that you can contact me after the talk with anything that isn't absolutely crystal clear. So it's mlcondic at neuro.utah.edu. Taking a picture is a very wise idea. All right, if I can have the next slide. So we're all very aware of the fact that there has been an ongoing assault on human dignity that takes a lot of different forms. So next slide. Human cloning, for example, is uh, the generation of humans for use in the laboratory, and it's only banned in eight states, with human stem cell research only banned in five. Assisted suicide is legal in five states and the District of Columbia. And we get papers with titles as shocking as afterbirth abortion, why should the baby live, as a serious ethical proposals. We also have people who are advancing the abandonment of the dead donor rule, which is a long-standing rule that you can only take organs for donation from people who are actually dead. Um, with, with the proposal that death should be in the eyes of the beholder, or the physician, or the person who needs the organ. 
Neonatal euthanasia, the Groganim Protocol, is actually practiced in many countries in Europe, and it is seriously debated in medical schools here as something we should adopt as well. When a baby is determined to not, be, not have a life worthy of living, should we be allowed to just actively kill it? And lastly, um, people talk about assisted suicide or assisted dying for healthy older people simply because they've become too much of a burden on society. The fact that we have to even seriously ask, is this a step too far, I think is a real bad indictment of, of where we stand as a society. Next slide. So there are two challenging questions regarding uh, human life. First, the beginning of life. When does human life begin, which I call the continuum problem. And second, when does human life end, which conversely is the persistence problem. So my talk is going to be divided in two sections. And I'll be trying to address both of these from the same framework, the framework of organization. Next slide. This is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start out talking about what's an organism. And I'm going to move this. So hopefully we don't get quite so much feedback. Um, then I'm going to spend the next pretty much half of the talk discussing when does life begin. And then move on to um, when does life end. So let's start with what's an organism. The concept of an organism really is not a simple one. We have from Merriam-Webster a definition that reads, one, a complex structure of interdependent and subordinate elements whose relations and properties are largely determined by their function in the whole. Or two, an individual constituted to carry on the activities of life by means of organs separate in function but mutually dependent, a living being. So both of these definitions stress what I consider to be the fundamental or defining aspect of an organism, which is that organisms consist of parts, so they're, they're not just a single thing, but those parts have different functions and the functions all integrate together in a coordinated way to support the life and health of the entity as a whole. So that's a nice simple definition, but as a scientist it isn't terribly satisfying. So I want a little more detail, and you can get more detail. This is a paper, a very long paper, well over 100 pages, um, for those who really want to dig deeply into this topic by Bernard Rosenblatt, and he defines 10 characteristics of an organism. So, uh, 100 pages and 10 characteristics is perhaps going off too much on the other side <laughs> from simplicity to way more complexity. So I'm gonna try to distill it down to four essential characteristics. First, what I would call autonomy, or the ability of the entity on its own to regulate its own function. So rising from its own processes and in, in, in of itself, it regulates its own function. And I would include uh, with self-maintenance also repair of injury. Second, the next four traits that Rosenblatt discuss, discusses have to do with integration or the ability of all the various organs and functions of the entity to work together in a coordinated way. Organisms are also capable of development, um, which is my field of interest. They, they grow to maturity, they reproduce, and they die. And lastly, they're able to adapt. So adaptation is distinct from autonomy in that adaptation is a, uh, a healthy response to changing environmental circumstances. So when the environment changes, the ability of the organism to alter its behavior and its internal processes in order to maintain its health and life is adaptation. So autonomy, integration, development, and adaptation, or if you are an opera fan like myself, you can remember it by AIDA, which is the, the acronym for those four things. So next, so AIDA. So now we're going to move on with that as kind of the foundational concept of what is an organism to, to the question of when does human life begin. And this raises, as I mentioned, the continuum problem. So what is that problem? Next slide. Oh, actually, before I get there, <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to review a little bit of human development. So I'm going to distill down, you know, probably eight weeks of a medical school course to maybe three slides. So 
put on your seat belts. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to go quickly. What you're looking at in this, this picture, this is a short movie taken from a fertility clinic. And it looks like a series of circles. The, the one to focus on is right in the middle, this kind of grainy looking circle, which is the one-celled embryo shortly after sperm egg fusion. Surrounding that embryo is another circle, um, sort of a clear fuzzy circle that's a acellular protein coat, kind of a jelly coat that protects the embryo during the early stages of life, known as the zona pellucida. And the bigger, brighter circle is the culture well that this embryo is being cultured in for the first roughly five days of life. So what happens is during the first five days, the embryo divides very rapidly and generates smaller cells that are known as blastomeres. At about three days of development, the embryo reaches a stage known as the morula stage. So it looks kind of like a, uh, a mulberry, and morula is the Latin word for mulberry. Shortly after you get to that stage, the cells of the morula will change their properties and undergo a process known as compaction, where the cells will adhere very tightly to each other, and this allows the embryo to transport water into the inside, and it blows up like a soccer ball. So at the end of five days, you have a structure known as the blastocyst, which is shown here. And the blastocyst is an important stage of human life because it's the first point at which we have distinct cell types with different properties in the embryo. So I describe this as kind of a fluid-filled soccer ball. The outer cells, the black and white hexagons of that soccer ball, are known as, oops, forward, let's see, are known as the trophectoderm, and they're going to largely produce the placenta. There's also a smaller group of cells on the inside of the soccer ball known as the inner cell mass. And that tiny group of cells, about eight to 10 cells, is going to produce the vast majority of the tissues and structures that you're carrying around in your body right now. So at this stage, at about five days, the embryo will implant into the uterus. And once implantation has happened, then development proceeds pretty rapidly. Next slide. So these are pictures of actual human embryos taken from the Carnegie Collection. The embryo we were just watching, that one-celled embryo is blown up up here, but its actual size would be the little dot above the number one. And these pictures represent the first eight weeks of life. So the so-called embryonic period, which is the period over which you go from a single cell to a fully formed, albeit pretty small, this is five millimeters here, but complete human body. So at the end of the first eight weeks, you have all the organs, structures, tissues, and systems that you're gonna ever have. And the remainder of prenatal life is not the embryonic period, it's the fetal period. So during the fetal period, uh, the fetus will grow enormously in size, the tissues and cells will mature biochemically, uh, but you're not gonna make any new structures. So all of the business end of building the body happens in the first eight weeks, which is the embryonic period. Next slide. Okay, so those few slides show you what happens during early human development, but they don't really address the question of when does life begin. And as soon as we ask that question, we, we have to face the continuum problem, which is that because development proceeds continuously from the one cell stage up through birth and beyond, many people will set essentially arbitrary points for when they think human life begins or when humans have value. For example, a lot of people like blastocyst formation, that stage at which we have the first two cell types arising in the embryo at about four days post sperm egg fusion. Alternatively, people will pick a little bit later point, the point of implantation at about five days, because that's the first point at which the embryo establishes a relationship with the mom. But you can go later than that. Many people like the formation of a structure known as the primitive streak which is kind of the earliest rudiment of the nervous system. Um, or you can go even later. Many people like an analogy to brain death. They'll, they'll kind of wave their hands and point to something that they'll call brain life or the acquisition of mature patterns of brain function, uh, which is a very ill-defined spot, but somewhere on maybe five months of development. But you can go even later than that. Peter Singer at Princeton University was famous for having proposed that um, self-awareness is uh, 
uh, the point at which meaningful human life begins, uh, a, a point at which he claimed happened about 28 days after birth. And as a developmental neuroscientist, my own personal favorite, given the very long time frame over which the brain develops, would be the next one, brain maturation, which doesn't happen until about 25 years after birth. So I used to tell my teenagers, you're not even a human yet, I can send you back to the human parts factory. <laughs> you know, so. OK, it's funny, but at the same time, I hope these examples illustrate to all of you that this is really just arbitrary. And choosing, next slide, choosing among them is really a matter of taste, utility, and I would also say power. He who has the power gets to choose, not a matter of science or reason. So it raises the question, how does science address this question? Next slide. Well, to answer that, unfortunately, we have to ask two separate questions. First, when is a new cell type produced from the interaction of sperm and egg? So, so long as we still have sperm and egg, we can't have anything new. We can't have even consider those cells to be human beings, right? Second, what's the difference between a human being and a human cell? So fortunately for us, that first question, when do we get a new cell type from the interaction of sperm and egg, um, has a pretty clear answer. So science addresses this question by using two very simple criteria. First, changes in cell type are determined or detected by changes in material composition, so what a cell is made out of, typically these reflect changes in gene utilization. So you turn on a gene or you turn it off and you gain something or lose something, or changes in behavior. And very often those two things happen together. If you alter what a cell is made out of, the, the sort of toolkit it has available to it, you can alter what that cell is capable of doing. Um, I can assure you that these two criteria are used throughout the scientific enterprise to determine when a new cell type arises, either in the laboratory or in an embryo. Um, thirdly, if a new cell type arises from an interaction of two or more pre-existing cell types, logic requires us to say that you can't have a new cell until an, the old cells are gone. So based on this, can we use these criteria to determine when a new cell type arises from sperm egg fusion. Is it in fact a new cell type or is it perhaps just a modified gamete? You often hear the product of sperm egg fusion referred to as a fertilized egg. So I hope to convince you that the term fertilized egg is a completely non-scientific term and actually completely incorrect. And unambiguously, a new cell arises at the instant of sperm egg fusion based on these criteria. So let's have the next slide. What you see here is a scanning electron micrograph that's been pseudo-colored to show the egg in pink and a sperm fusing to it in blue. So when the outer surfaces of these two cells come into contact, next slide, um, in a very rapid process, the external surface of the plasma membrane of these two cells will undergo a well-studied event, which is membrane fusion. And it's a very fast event. It happens in about a quarter of a second, 250 milliseconds. So there's an instant during which you go from two separate cells to a single cell with a fused external membrane. Once that happens, the components that used to be uniquely associated with the sperm, so the lipid and protein that used to be on the surface of the sperm, are now free to diffuse into the surface of this new cell changing its molecular composition. The sperm itself has ruptured and it will eject all of its intracellular contents inside of the new cell. So clearly, the sperm as a separate cell has ceased to exist um, in this instant of sperm egg fusion. So what about the egg? Next slide. So upon fusion and destruction of the sperm, the resulting cell has a new molecular composition that's distinct from that of an egg. So we've already talked about the incorporation of the lipid and protein from the sperm into the surface of the cell. Um, but the changes are more extensive than that. This cell also now has a new genetic composition with half of its DNA being derived from the sperm, from dad and half from mom. But the cell also radically alters its behavior within 
seconds to at most minutes following fusion with the sperm. This cell will initiate a molecular cascade that over the next 30 minutes will result in the deposition of enzymes uh, into the extracellular space between the surface of the cell and the zona pellucida that we pointed out earlier. So this is a really un egg like activity because the whole purpose of being an egg, the whole reason an egg exists, is to find a, a sperm and fuse to it. That's the job of a gamete. And yet these enzymes that are put out by this new cell, their function is to specifically destroy any remaining sperm binding sites. So instantaneously upon the fusion of sperm and egg, this cell enters into a new pathway, a new set of behavior that's completely antagonistic to the behavior of a gamete. And as a consequence, we can say that the egg as a separate haploid gamete has ceased to exist, and a new cell with unique material composition, with unique genetics, and with unique behavior has come into existence in this 250 milliseconds. Next slide. So what is this new cell? This is our second question. We can unambiguously conclude that it is a new cell, but what is it? Well, its scientific name is the one-celled embryo or zygote, but looking at this picture is not terribly informative. So is the zygote a new individual human being or perhaps just a new kind of human cell, a cell that's on its way to becoming a human being but isn't one yet? And the difficulty we have answering that question is that at early stages, recognizable human form and function are not evident. So even as an embryologist who has studied embryonic development for you know, 40 years, I don't look at these pictures and go, oh, it's a baby. <laughs> you know, we, just, we just don't have that intuitive sense. So you see something, and what it looks like doesn't tell us much about what it is. So how do we know that a zygote or a morula or a blastocyst is a new human being and not merely a new human cell or maybe a ball of cells? And this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer for at least three reasons that have to do with the difference between organisms or whole intact beings and cells. So the first one is shown on the next slide. Cells themselves are living organisms. So cells are alive, they have integrated behavior, they have parts, and those parts work together for the survival and function of the cell as a whole. And I'm gonna convince you of this with a short movie Oops, if we could stop the movie, maybe. Okay, so cells um, exhibit autonomously coordinated activity of parts for the good of the cell as a whole. So this is a movie that was taken back in 1958 by a professor at Vanderbilt University, uh, David Rogers. He took a blood sample and he put it into culture dish and he made this movie. So the movie has three actors. The star of the movie is this cell here. It's a neutrophil, which is the type of blood cell that the job of this cell in the body is to chase out bacteria and destroy them. So when you have an infection, that's what a neutrophil will do. The other cells, the sort of round or kind of star-shaped cells, are red blood cells. And the third cell type are these little dots, which are bacteria. So what you can see, if we want to play the movie now, is that the neutrophil has parts, it can it has behavior, it detects its environment, it moves around obstacles, it definitely has a goal here <laughs> of trying to capture those bacteria, um, and it's very persistent in, in doing so. The suspense is killing me, is it gonna get it? <laughs> yes! <laughs> so, so, this really shows you, if we can have the next animation, um, that Cells not only are organisms, next slide, but that cell type specific properties, the properties that were built into this neutrophil during the life of Dr. Rogers, persist even when this cell is removed from his body and put into culture. So the properties of cells are very durable. The bacteria are still behaving like bacteria, the neutrophil is still detecting them and trying to kill them, and the red blood cells couldn't care less. Next slide. <laughs> 
A second confusing feature of trying to distinguish between cells and organisms is that cell-cell interactions can mimic normally occurring developmental processes. And I'll give you just one example. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of a mouse embryo at about 10 days of development. And at this stage, uh, the embryo is starting to develop the forelimbs and the hind limbs in structures known as limb buds. We can go to the next slide. So for the, this experiment, to look at the kinds of cell-cell interactions that can occur, limb buds were removed from a mouse at about embryonic day 10 and placed into culture. At this stage, limb buds are very simple. They consist of two undifferentiated cell layers, an outer layer um, that's an epithelium, and an inner layer, sort of a disorganized mass of cells that's known as a mesenchyme. So they cultured these limb buds for seven days in organ culture, and this is what happened. All on their own, they went on to produce a very normal, structurally normal mouse limb. Uh, this is a cartoon or sort of a diagram of what a mouse limb would look like attached to a mouse at about the same stage of development. And all of the bones, tendons, and other structures that exist in the limb developed completely on their own. Next slide. The third feature that makes it difficult to distinguish between something that clearly is an organism and something that's maybe just a tissue or a group of cells that are interacting is that even more complex systemic kinds of functions can either arise and or persist in culture of tissues. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, in this case, the experimenters were interested in studying the process of wound healing. So they took a piece of skin and they put it in a culture dish and wounded it by scraping it with a glass pipette to create a scar or an injury. And over time, within 72 hours, this group of cells in a culture dish underwent an absolutely stereotypic normal process of wound healing that replicated all of the things that would naturally happen in your body. But you can even look at more complex features than this. Next slide. <laughs> these are the kinds of experiments that give biologists a bad name because it makes us look like Frankenstein. So these guys were interested in looking at um, kidney and uh, liver interactions. So they took a liver and a kidney from a, from a cow and connected them together with pipes and maintained them in dishes in the laboratory to see what that artificial system was capable of doing. And what they found was that many of the natural functions of these organs, the roles that they would play in the body, persist in a disembodied state, including the maintenance of homeostasis, uh, fluid balance, urine production, ion or pH balance, and detoxification of blood. So complex systemic functions can persist in culture with sufficient technical support. And this point in particular is going to become really important when we move on to talking about death. So keep that image in mind. All right, which leads us to the central problem in thinking about both the beginning of life and the end of life. Both human cells and human beings are alive, and they're human. But human beings are not just a collection of living human cells. So how do we tell the difference? And if there's only one thing you remember from my talk, I want it to be this. This is really the key question in all of the debates about when life begins and when life ends. OK, so how do we as, as Catholics tell the difference? We can ask this question by asking, what causes a human being to be different from a human cell? And the answer to that, that the church teaches us, is that the rational soul is the unique form of the body. This was promulgated by the, Conce the Council of Vienne in the 1300s, by the Lateran Council in the 1500s, and by a brief of Pius IX in the 1800s. So at least three times, authoritative teaching of the church has asserted that the rational soul is the form of the body. This is reflected in the catechism that also states, the unity of soul and body is so profound that one has to consider the soul to be the form of the body, i.e., it is because of its spiritual soul that the body made of matter becomes living 
Human body, spirit and matter in man are not two natures united, but rather their union forms a single nature. So this is a tough concept. It's a concept that's hard for us to wrap our heads around because, you know, we all grew up with Hollywood, you know, that depicts the ghost, you know, in the machine or, you know, pixie dust somehow sprinkled onto inorganic matter to make it become alive. And this is really not what our church teaches us. Our church teaches us that the soul and the body are intimately united in a way that cannot be separated, such that there's only one nature. What does this mean for our understanding of the difference between human cells and human beings? Next slide. So the substantial form, which is a more philosophical term for the soul, causes all acts of a living being. So it's the organizing principle of the body, and it causes all bodily activities, including life. All living beings, everything from bacteria through single-celled organisms, plants, animals, they all have souls. This comes to us both originally from Aristotle, but it was adopted by Thomas Aquinas uh, as part of the understanding of what makes something alive. The human soul is intrinsically united to the body, and all acts of the soul manifest as bodily acts. So there's no ghost that can do things without those activities being reflected in a bodily action. Even things as basic as thinking. Thinking is always associated with a change in the state of neural activity of your brain. A bodily act united to that act of the soul. When cells are removed from the body, like that little neutrophil I showed you in the movie, or after the person themselves is dead, um, those cells will undergo what's called a substantial change to obtain a new kind of soul, a cellular soul. So Dr. Rogers' soul was not reaching out into that culture dish to control the activity of that neutrophil. Even though he had produced it, and his soul, had that neutrophil remained in his body, would have controlled the activity of the cell. That cell underwent a substantial change and acquired a new kind of cell, soul, a cellular soul. Okay, next slide. And this brings us to uh, thinking about uh, different levels of organization to help us understand the difference between cells and organisms. So at the bottom, I'm sorry, the color is very dark, is inorganic matter, biological molecules. And moving up requires a soul, requires a living cell like our little neutrophil. So to get to the level of cellular organization, we have to have life, and cells must have a soul. So cells integrate all of the structures and functions that are needed for the life of that living entity. To move up to tissue, like the liver and kidney that we saw, or that piece of skin that was in the laboratory, we need to have two different cell types that interact with each other to produce more complex kinds of interactions. Interactions that emerge from the cell types specific properties that exist within that tissue. Moving up to the level of actually an organism, one of us, requires that all of the cells function together as an integrated whole, and it requires a new kind of soul. It requires the soul of an organism. So the human soul orders all of the properties of the organism and all of its cellular parts, but the molecular composition and the specific organization of cells can control uh, their behavior, including the production of tissues, the functions that we saw in those organ cultures, the production of limbs from two pieces of tissue in the laboratory. Okay. Which brings up two serious errors that we're going to come back to, both for this part of the talk and also for the talk, part of the talk on death, that are in serious opposition to Catholic teaching, reductionism and dualism. So let's start with reductionism. The reductionist, whose position should be familiar to most of us, is anyone who's ever interacted with scientists, this is probably 99% of my colleagues, would say that a human is a collection of living cellular parts that simply add up to a human living being. They would then therefore say that development is, the, is a process that involves the gradual acquisition of complex 
cellular function. Therefore, there's no single moment at which life begins. And when a human can be considered alive enough to be the subject of human rights is an arbitrary decision. So in contrast, the dualist would say the soul is not united to the physical body, but rather it's the Hollywood version of the ghost in the machine. And therefore, the soul can have immaterial acts that are not associated with any physical parts or physical acts. And so long as the potential for development exists, the soul might be present. And consequently, gametes or stem cells um, or other entities that are produced in the laboratory, maybe even those limb buds in culture, might, might be a living, a living entity. They could be embryos. So both reductionism and dualism support the view that the precise moment when human life begins cannot be determined by science. So what do I say? I say hogwash on all of that. Next slide. <laughs> what comes to our rescue here is the concept of a multicellular organism, an organism like ourselves. So multicellular organisms, such as human beings, are uniquely capable of development, which is an autonomous, self-directed maturation to a characteristic adult form. Interactions between the subcellular and cellular parts of a multicellular organism are ordered to the good of the multicellular whole and not to the continued existence of the cell as a cell. So unlike the neutrophil, all of the parts of which are ordered to simply keep that cell alive, many, many things happen in development that make no sense whatsoever except within the context of the continued maturation, health, and survival of that entity as it moves towards maturity. Adaptation and wound healing exist to preserve the healthy function of the multicellular whole rather than the individual cellular parts. So when does that kind of multicellular organismal function begin? I think most of us would agree this is probably an organism. And even our, our opponents would agree, perhaps, that this is an organism. I mean, it has parts. The parts work together to keep that whole thing alive. But this, is this an organism? So I have a friend who's an attorney, and every time he sees this picture, he always reacts exactly the same way. Nah, that's not an organism. That's a bare aspirin. <laughs> and I have to admit, it does kind of look a little bit like a beer aspirin. Okay, but I hope to convince you <laughs> that in contrast to my, to my um, attorney friend, this is unambiguously an organism. So from the one cell stage onward, human embryos unambiguously function as human, i.e. multicellular organisms, even though they start as a single cell. And why do I say that? Because they exhibit all of the aida functions or features that are definitive of an organism. So I'm gonna go through them in a little bit different order because it makes more logical sense. They show development or growth towards a characteristic mature state. They show autonomy, adaptation, and integration. But we're gonna start with development. So this is the picture I showed you earlier. And I made the point that within minutes of sperm egg fusion, this one cell immediately enters into a biochemical sequence that cannot be understood except as pointing towards this. It antagonizes the function of gametes, and everything it's doing is not necessary for that cell to stay alive. It's only necessary to build this. So it enters it immediately into a process of development, into the process of building itself and it proceeds there quite rapidly in a period of eight weeks. Next slide. So what about autonomy or repair of injury such that the unified function of the entity is preserved? Well, embryos are actually really, really good at this too, and I'm gonna give you just one example, that of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So here what you see is a embryo at about an eight cell stage that's been immobilized by suction against a polished glass pipette, and then you insert a sharper pipette and take a cell out. 
So this is done for parents who might be genetic carriers of a disease or perhaps are older and might have acquired mutations that could impact the health and survival of their offspring. So what they do is they biopsy these embryos, they allow the embryos to develop to the blastocyst stage, and shockingly, embryos recover from what can only be characterized as a catastrophic injury. So to lose one-eighth of your body at a very tender age, you know, that's, that's a pretty disastrous thing. Most of us would not survive a similar injury at our age. But embryos regenerate this missing tissue and proceed with development normally, such that there have been many thousands of live births from biopsied embryos worldwide. So what about adaptation? or the ability to adjust to abnormal circumstances. Embryos are actually pretty good at this as well. And again, I'll give you just a single example, um, that of ectopic implantation. So in most cases, when an embryo implants someplace other than the uterus, they don't survive because it's very, very difficult to establish an adequate circulation with the mom in order to produce a placenta. But there are cases, like this one, <laughs> where this little baby, who was born in 2003, developed entirely to term nine months inside her mother's liver. <laughs> okay, so how did that even happen? Well, um, ovulation occurred, and instead of going through the fallopian tubes down to the uterus, she took a wrong turn, ended up in the mother's abdominal cavity, and was fortunate enough to attach to the liver, which is a very soft organ, and is highly vascularized. So she was able to establish a placental circulation with mom and developed totally normally inside her mother's liver. At the end of nine months, they just cut open the mother's abdomen, sliced over her liver, and popped the baby out. So if a baby can go completely to term inside her mother's liver, I think that's pretty good testimony to the ability of embryos to adapt to abnormal circumstances. So last one, integration or the coordinated function of parts to support the function of the entity as a whole. Um, Embryos are also very good at this, and I'll give you just one example. A lot of work has shown that the pattern of cell division at the two-cell stage determines what structures are going to be produced from each of those cells. So if you have a pattern that looks like this, where each of the two cells divides north pole to south pole, you end up with four cells that have been color-coded here. And the pink and the red cells um, will largely, although not exclusively, contribute to the postnatal body. And the blue and the green cells will largely, although not exclusively, contribute to the placenta. So that could happen in a lot of different ways. But we know how it happens from this experiment. If you take three embryos that are all showing this pattern of cell division, and you isolate three red cells, three blue cells, and three green cells, one from each embryo, and then you transfer those aggregates to a surrogate mom, what you find is that the red cells can produce live-born mice, in most cases, but the green cells never can all on their own. And that tells us that at the four cell stage, cells have different developmental abilities. So they're not all the same. And that normally they have to work together in an integrated way in order for development to, to proceed. Next slide. So I've reviewed these early integrated kinds of events. If you want to search my name, and when does life begin? You'll find this paper. It was published in 2014, I think, um, where I review the, the first four or five days of life and many dozens of events that happen that can only make sense as part of a developmental sequence, as an integrated activity of the embryo for itself. So um, this work indicates very clearly that sperm egg fusion sets off a molecular cascade that controls events taking place hours or even weeks later. And that these events are not required for the cells to stay alive. The cell is not just maintaining itself as a cell, but they only make sense as part of a developmental sequence that's generated by an organism. And while some scientists may not like this conclusion or deny it, it's supported by hundreds of peer review papers. And I can say is entirely uncontested in the literature. Every time I give this talk, I ask everybody in the room, Hit me with your best shot. <laughs> if you have any data that you can show me that contradicts this, I would love to see it. I'm very familiar with the literature, but I might have missed it. Um, and while you can find lots of papers where scientists will simply deny it, 
I have yet to have anybody present even a single shred of evidence against it. So what can we conclude about the beginning of life? First, a new cell, the zygote, with unique material composition, genes, and behavior comes into existence at this instant of sperm egg fusion. The cell exhibits all of the characteristics of a complete, albeit immature, human being, and therefore, human life commences at sperm egg fusion. A human zygote is a human being, despite the fact that we don't, we don't feel like it is when we look at it. And this is an evidence-based definition of when human life begins. Okay, so we're now gonna move on to death. <laughs> Next slide. So thinking about death is challenging. There is not a universal consensus among Catholic thinkers, much less non-Catholic thinkers, regarding the criteria for death, and there's no official church doctrine. Therefore, you're free to think whatever you'd like on this topic. However, appreciating the difference between cells and organisms is going to be key to making a sound judgment. And I would call this a work in progress, even though I've been thinking about it for quite a long time. <laughs> so what is the current standard for declaration of death in the United States? The Uniform Determination of Death Act was approved by the American Bar Association in 1981, and it is currently supported by almost identical legislation in all states. And it states, an individual who has sustained either one irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, or two irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem, is dead. The preamble to this act clarifies that under part two, the entire brain must cease to function irreversibly. The entire brain includes the brainstem as well as the neocortex, and the concept of entire brain distinguishes determination of death under this act from, quote, neocortical death or, quote, persistent vegetative state. These are not deemed valid medical or legal bases for determination of death. So that's what death is. Um, and I want to emphasize to you that despite the seeming clarity here. All definitions of death, all ways of diagnosing death, um, have a certain degree of ambiguity to them. It is not uncommon, for example, for people to have what appears to be irreversible cessation of heart activity. One case I'm familiar with, um, that persisted for several hours while the patient was talking to the doctor as his heart is being massaged to pump the blood because his heart was not functioning. So ultimately this patient did survive with a heart transplant, but his heart stopped functioning and he was clearly not dead. Okay, so how do we think about this? And we come back to this notion of levels of organization. The simplest or most intuitive way for people to think about death is, next, next animation, or what, or what death requires is this one, that death requires, go ahead, move forward, there we go, a loss of all organization or total disintegration of the living being. I mean, that would be great. But what is total disintegration? This, this concept has a, a, a nice pedigree, Saint Pope St. John Paul II told us that death of the person is a single event, consisting in the total disintegration of that unitary and integrated whole that is the personal self. It results from the separation of the life principle or soul from the corporal reality of the person. But what exactly is total disintegration? <laughs> what does it look like? And how do we recognize when it's happened? Well, I can answer what it's not a little bit more easily than what it is. So what total disintegration does not mean, death is not the complete loss of bodily unity or total disintegration in the simplest sense. We don't immediately turn into dust <laughs> next animation when we die. Wouldn't that be great? It would simplify this whole process, you know? <laughs> Pile of dust, oh, he must be dead. <laughs> okay, but obviously this does not happen. <laughs> 
Death is also not a complete loss of cellular life. When we die, we don't just instantly turn into a decomposing corpse. Anyone who's seen anyone die knows that they're still warm. And living cells can be isolated from dead bodies for not just hours, but days, weeks, and in some cases, months. Death is also not a complete loss of communication and bodily structure. So we build a lot of structure into our bodies during development, and none of that goes away when we die. So we don't suddenly just disintegrate into a pile of little amoebas that all crawl off and do their own thing, right? We stay structurally looking like a human, and many of the structural functions that humans have persist. So what, in fact, survives after declaration of death by any means? <laughs> Next slide. Well, the most important thing to appreciate, given our long discussion of the difference between a living person and a living cell, is that living cells persist. So this was a paper where people were looking at the ability to isolate chondrocytes um, from dead bodies. <laughs> and what you see here is fraction of living cells over time. And when you maintain a corpse at 23 degrees, you can isolate living cells out to 60 days. A little bit less at 35 degrees, but still out to you know, about 35 days. That's weeks, months. So cells can survive and continue to function for weeks or even longer after declaration of death. Initially, there's a rapid period of cell death because many cells in your body are very, very sensitive to hypoxia, to, to loss of oxygen. So when you stop breathing, many, many cells will die very rapidly. Um, over minutes to hours, there's typically a very dramatic fall off in metabolic activity um, so that eventually you have decomposition. However, if we have external life support, if we provide oxygen, um, you can extend this period for a very long time, weeks or even longer. Next slide. So this raises a lot of doubt in people's minds about whether or not our standards for declaring death re actually reflect death. Uh, one of the largest critical thinkers in this area is a person by the name of Alan Schumann. He's a neurologist, a very good man. Um, in this paper, he identified a number of biologic functions that persist after death, including immune defense, proportionate growth, wound healing, and all the others listed here. So it is important to note that all of these functions are very significantly impaired after either death of the brain or cessation of cardiopulmonary function. Um, so, essentially all of them are no longer acting or being done at the level that they would be in a living person. And so, how are we to interpret this? The persistence of this function. So, interpretation is really complicated by the fact that most of these functions are preserved at least to some extent by cells and culture. For example, next, next. So, so what that raises is that these complicated, complex functions both persist after death and also in cell culture. For example, um, immune defense. Neutrophils are part of the immune system. And as you saw, a neutrophil in a laboratory dish still functions exactly like it would in your body. Uh, as we also saw, proportionate growth. We can have a disembodied limb bud doing exactly what it would do if it were growing into a mature leg. Wound healing. Skin heals itself in the laboratory dish. And many aspects of body metabolism are maintained by two organs isolated in, in petri dishes. So I'm going to expand just one of them. We're going to come back to the neutrophil and look at a little bit of what is really happening when we say, when Schumann tells us, that the immune system continues to function after death of the brain. So this is a little diagram looking at the, prime, the main interactions of between the brain functions shown here in yellow, 
and the bodily functions shown here in, in blue uh, at, during, in a living person. So the immune system is very, very complex, and there's a lot of crosstalk between the body and the brain, and the brain and the body, to make sure that the immune system continues to function the way it should. So in life, the brain integrates immune function both by receiving signals from the body and also sending signals to the body to balance the function of the immune system. But if you take the brain out of the picture, we still have living cells. We still have neutrophils, macrophages, T cells. And they continue to function the way they normally would. And so on a very primitive level, some aspects of the immune system will persist. The cells that comprise, could we go back, that comprise the immune system are gonna to continue to stay alive and to fight local um, infectious events. Um, but there's no body-wide communication. And therefore, there can be no adaption, adaptation to changing circumstances in the immune system. Okay, next slide. So functions that persist after death are all exactly like this. And I think the best illustration of this is from the study of um, women who are pregnant and who have uh, an injury of some sort that causes their brain to die, and they're declared dead. And yet they're maintained on life support uh, until the fetus that they're carrying is mature enough that it can survive independent of the mom. So this is a review that looked at 30 cases of fetal gestation following death of the brain. And what the authors state is that during extended life support, they refer to these individuals whose brains have died as patients. Patients developed several complications, including infection, hemodynamic instability, diabetes insipidus, pan uh, hypopituitarianism, pocleothermia, metabolic instability, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. So that sounds like a lot of medical jargon, but each of these, every single one of them is something that could kill you. So why didn't it? Because the authors characterize the enormous challenge of management and offer guidelines for what they call continuous active adjustment of things as basic as cardiac output, respiration, endocrine balance, body temperature, thrombosis, nutrition, as well as standard fetal monitoring. So the individual whose brain was dead is not maintaining integration, adaptation, or autonomy. The physicians are maintaining it. Next slide. Oh, just uh, a more recent review. If we click forward, anyone who's interested. This was just published last year, uh, and it reviewed 35 cases, so an additional five cases. These are very rare cases, but these authors make pretty much exactly the same conclusions. That the only reason the physiologic function of the individuals whose brains are dead is maintained is because they're externally maintained. Next slide. So this leads us to, again, our old friends, reductionism and dualism, where the reductionists would say, a living human is a collection of living cells that add up to a living being. And death is, of course, a process that involves gradual loss of cellular function. So in that little curve I showed you where you have gradual loss of cells, that's the gradual process of death. And therefore, there's no single moment of death. And when a human being can be considered dead enough for organ donation is an arbitrary decision. Conversely, the dualist would say the soul is not united with the physical body, it's a ghost in the machine. And therefore, the soul can have immaterial acts that are not associated with any physical acts. And so long as the body persists, or any functions, of the body persists. So long as there's a single living neutrophil, the soul might also persist. And consequently, you can't be certain when the soul has left the body until the entire system breaks down. And both reductionism and dualism would support the view that their person might still be in there after death of the brain or after declaration of death. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So how do we get out of this? <laughs> I would propose the concept of parsimony is a very helpful concept here. So to frame the discussion, I would argue that if a biologic function can be explained solely by the properties of cells, then a higher level of organization should not be invoked. And two, if a biologic function cannot be explained solely by the properties of cells, then a higher level of organization must be invoked. Reductionism would assert that number one is always the case, and a dualist would assert that number two can never be ruled out. And this is why they're both fallacies. Because as Catholics, we believe the soul and the body are united. The soul is the form of the body, and there must be an instant at which death occurs. Next slide. Our central problem again, <laughs> that both living cells and living beings are alive, but we believe that humans are not just a collection of cells. So are there any biologic activities that cannot be explained simply by the properties of cells, tissues, and organs? Next slide. I would say yes. The persistence of a rational animal must be due to the persistence of a human soul. So Aquinas um, gives us a definition of humans as rational animals. Um, and this has been widely accepted, even outside of Catholic circles, as a good definition of what a human being is and a good essential definition. So humans are rational animals, and therefore, clear evidence for the persistence of a human soul is provided either by rationality or by animality or organismal function. And this gives us two criteria for a living person. Persistence of the capacity for mental function, no matter how impaired. Mental activity requires a functioning brain. Now, it can be a very debilitated brain. And as a neuroscientist, I could give you many, many examples of people who have lost vast areas of their nervous system's function, but still have consciousness, still respond to their own name, still respond to music. Some people even who have an active mental life, but are paralyzed and can't communicate it to anyone. Second, persistence of intrinsic autonomous integration of biological function or organismal function or animality with Aquinas's definition, even in the absence of evident mental function. Both of these functions are due to the same organizing principle and therefore persistence of either is sufficient to conclude to the presence of a human soul. So let's put this into practice with some well-known examples. Christopher Reeve, he was conscious. He had limited autonomous integration. He was dependent upon life support. I would argue that he no longer functioned as a human organism. However, he continues to have mental function and therefore he's still alive. In contrast, Terry Schiavo had limited or absent consciousness, I would say absent, given the state of her brain. However, she sustained autonomous integration. Normal care was all that was required to keep her functioning well. She needed food and water, not life support. She no longer exercises mental function, but she continues to function as an organism, and therefore she is also still alive. So how are these situations different from death? So after brain or cardiac death, the four marks of a living being are lost. Vital functions, as we saw in the case of pregnant women, are no longer autonomously maintained. They're maintained in a significantly impaired state by machines and by caregivers. There is no longer any internal system after the death of the brain that can respond to the needs of the body as a whole. So integration is lost. There is no development. So in no case has an individual undergone normal maturation after death. And there's only limited ability to detect both internal and external conditions, and therefore there can be no systemic adaptation. 
So back to our levels of organization. We're almost done. Um, despite the compelling emotional nature of this concept of total disintegration, I would argue it's not necessary that we go all the way down to rotting material before someone's dead. I would say going down one level. Next slide. So living cells and, and tissues are not the same as a living person, and going down a single level is all that's required for death. There are some caveats here that I want to make sure to address. Diagnosis can be a very serious problem, and language can be a very serious problem. We've all seen headlines like this, brain dead student wakes up after doctors suggest pulling the plug. So some individuals are referred to as brain dead by those who advocate letting the patient die. I have to say in academia, some of us refer to other individuals as brain dead simply because we disagree with them, <laughs> all right? But that doesn't actually make them brain dead, all right? So, so it's really, really important to distinguish the use of terminology to not call someone who's in a coma or in a persistent vegetative state or anything else as brain dead. Okay, and the use of that term is what confuses a lot of people about the nature of brain death and whether or not brain death is actually a good criteria for death because we see things like this. A second caveat is this one. This is Jahi McMahon, who was a very uh, famous case of a person who was declared death using adult criteria for brain death. Um, so she was declared dead by standard medical criteria and yet, I think, in, in final analysis, she was just brain damaged because children do not behave the same way as adults. And we have a real failure in the medical profession to have pediatric criteria for death that are adequate and reliable. So how do we then know, given these caveats, with certainty that there has been irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain? So I'll give you some practical pointers to close. The first is functional versus clinical criteria. The vast majority of death cases are diagnosed by clinical criteria, by a physician actually looking at a patient and determining whether or not they show signs of persistence of the brain. But we can look much more carefully than that. So this is a technique, for example, that's called SPECT, which is um, here we're imaging a brain in this kind of a Plane. So this would be as if you chopped the top of someone's head off and just looked straight down on their brain. And what these colors show you are different levels of metabolic activity that are occurring in different regions of the nervous system of the brain in a normal patient. Next slide. So here's a case using the same technique of a woman who was admitted to the hospital with um, a, ma a massive stroke. So you can see there's a dark hole in her brain. And that means nothing is happening there. There is no utilization of energy anywhere in this part of the brain that's black. So those cells are dead. And they're not going to come back. The nervous system does not regenerate. So this was at her initial admission to the hospital. And three days later, this is what SPECT revealed. So the colors you're seeing are the colors associated with the metabolic activity of the skin and muscles of the scalp. But this is a brain dead individual. And it's completely unambiguous. There's no guessing here. A slightly less sophisticated, but I think also very reliable technique is shown in the last segment of this slide. So this is a way of looking at the blood flow or blood circulation through the head. So neural cells are extremely sensitive to loss of oxygen, and they will die within minutes if there's no circulation to the brain. And you can with a relatively simple test in this person. In this case, an individual had a stroke that occluded the, the cranial arteries, and so they had no blood circulating to their brain. And if this happened more than two minutes ago, this person's brain is dead. And this shows you the entire brain, including the brainstem. Next slide. <laughs> 
So concerns about misdiagnosis, which I think we all have, practical advice. First off, I think we all need to advocate for revision of pediatric criteria for death. This is clearly a huge problem, and there's, it's indefensible. I mean, we need better pediatric criteria. Be educated. Ask questions. Don't just accept what your physician tells you if we're talking about a loved one. Get a second opinion. You are absolutely entitled to a second opinion, and in most states, it's actually the law that at least two doctors diagnose death independently. Third, rely on a functional diagnosis. If you're not convinced or you are worried that perhaps the physician is trying to push a definition of death to unload the patient off of the hospital's you know, expense list or obtain organs, um, you can insist on a functional diagnosis of the type that I've just shown you. Wait. The lady who was admitted with stroke, two days later, her brain was completely dead, and there was no ambiguity about it. So wait 48, 72 hours. The hospital will just have to sustain your loved one for that period and then redo the test. I also would really urge all of us to consider the tough questions in advance so you won't feel pressured. A lot of times when people are concerned about a diagnosis of death, what they're really concerned about is that they were asked to make a decision when they weren't ready. So decide in advance is providing food and water life support. What do you think about if we do nothing? Is that killing my loved one, or is that just allowing them to die? And finally, what really, in your opinion, are extraordinary means? And that's going to vary a lot, depending on your financial situation, your insurance, everything else. OK, conclusions regarding death. Death never involves instantaneous, total disintegration of all biologic activity. And it doesn't need to. It would be great if we turned into a pile of dust, but we just don't. That's not how God built us. Many biologic functions persist after declaration of death by any means, and both with and without life support. Those chondrocytes that I showed you were isolated from tissue that was not maintained in any way. Third, all of the functions that persist after declaration of death are significantly impaired and most are also observed in cell and organ culture. The two reliable signs that a human organism persists are the persistence of self-directed integration, or animality, and the persistence of any form of brain function. Since we can't crawl into their brains, as long as they have some kind of brain function, I'm willing to give them the possibility of rational thought. And the overall summary of the beginning and end of life a human soul causes all the activities of life. Autonomy, integration, and development, and adaptation, or AIDA, are the unique hallmarks of living multicellular organisms. Organismal function begins clearly at sperm egg fusion at that instant of membrane fusion. Cells removed from the body or persisting in the body after death retain characteristic properties. Think of our little neutrophil. With interactions among them and among different cell types being sufficient to produce uh, structures and support complex functions. Think about our little limb bud. Think about the liver and kidney. The persistence of either organismal autonomy or brain function provides evidence that a human being is present. And a sound view of both the beginning and end of life must explain, regardless of where you fall down on this question, must explain the difference between human beings and human cells while avoiding the errors of reductionism and dualism. OK. And I will stop there. I think Chris might want to make an announcement, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Maureen, for this outstanding and enlightening talk. Um, in the interest of time, uh, although Maureen has satisfied our hunger for knowledge, um, we are bodies and souls. So um, to allow time for lunch, I would suggest, if it's OK with you, that mm -hmm. we move over to lunch in the parish hall. And if people have questions, um, they can just 
come bug you. And, Absolutely. Uh, or you since you all obediently wrote down my email. <laughs> you can email your questions, um, but just feel free to bug Maureen uh, while we're over in the parish hall. And uh, so thank you again. Okay. Thank you, Father Ty. And thank you, Project Defending Life, for the lunch we're about to enjoy. Yeah, for those of you who want to stay for literally a minute and a half, I have, I have a final illustration that I think is helpful, at least for me. So feel free to go and get some lunch, but if you'd like to stay, could I have the slides back up? Next slide. I think I had a black slide, and then I had one more. Marching band analogy. OK, so imagine you're sitting in a stadium, and you're watching a marching band march out onto the field. And over time, they eventually reorganize into a pattern that looks like this. They have different colored hats. OK, well, so that formation of pattern would indicate that human agency is in control of the hats. It's making a pattern that can't be explained by the properties of the hats themselves. Yet if at the end of the performance, the hats are left on the ground and the marchers walk away, the behavior of the hats ceases to be controlled by humans the instant they leave the marchers' hands. And from that moment forward, the hats are controlled simply by their own physical properties and by random events. So some animals might come and run away with a few of the hats. Maybe some of the marchers knock the hats over as they leave the field. Maybe a wind comes and blows some of it away. And it may take a long time for the pattern to completely fade. But the pattern that's maintained by the freestanding hats does not tell you that people are still present. It just tells you that human agency ordered the hats. And that agency no longer has to be active for the pattern to persist. So the persistence of a pattern does not necessarily require ongoing human presence, because the humans built the pattern into the hats when they were there. All right, I will leave you with that thought.